I'd love to introduce you to some folks in the office. Awesome. Yeah, let's so, do it. Um, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. All right. Well, so first of all, really important. the 10th episode of Femgineer TV brought to you by Pivotal Tracker. I'm your host, Pornima Vijay Shankar, the founder of Femgineer. Femgineer is an education company where we teach innovators how to build software products so they can find freedom in their careers, enrich other people's lives, and make the tech community a lot more inclusive and flexible. When you're at a startup, your head's in the weeds. You're developing a product and untangling all sorts of operational issues. So it can be hard to look at the big picture and think about how your company is doing from a momentum, traffic, and investment angle. But all of these things are important criteria to think about, whether you decide that you wanna bootstrap your business or take funding now versus later. To help us identify what the major trends are that we need to keep track of, I've invited Danielle Morell, the CEO and co-founder of Mattermark. Mattermark launched in 2013 as a data platform for VCs. Their goal is to become the go-to platform for tracking startup growth and identifying startups that are lucrative. Hi Danielle, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so we go way back to probably before either one of us were in startups. Yep. Uh, but for our viewers out there, why don't you tell us how you got lured into startup land? Yeah, you know, I was working um, in Seattle. I was working for a Fortune 500 shipping company, and some friends of mine left Amazon to start a startup, and I didn't really know what that meant. So I remember getting sent a link to a TechCrunch article about them, and that began my exploration of what is this whole world that they're a part of. Where I was, they were building really old school technology for shipping pretty old school industry mm -hmm. um, and this startup was building tools for mobile this is before there's even an iPhone app store yeah so it just made me very curious what is this thing they're doing and uh, so what was your first startup was it up in Seattle it was or? up in Seattle so I actually ended up joining that company about uh -huh. a year later and working with them for about I'd say 18 months or so kind of right up before the economic crash in 2008 mm -hmm. um, and it was a company called Pelago it built a kind of a precursor to Foursquare so it was an app where you could check in at locations and share your location with friends. Nice. And then uh, what brought you down here to the Bay Area? Yeah, so obviously I mentioned the economy really tanked and um, I for a while thought I was going to start a company but it was pretty scary to start a company at that time. Yeah. Um, I, I did start one and then pretty quickly met CEO of uh, Twilio, Jeff Lawson. Mm -hmm. um, and he needed someone just on contract to help them with managing their developer community. And I was just thrilled to have a job at that time. Um, so I started working with them and he was actually living in Seattle. But pretty quickly we realized it was going to make a lot more sense to be in the Bay Area for a number of reasons. And definitely our customers are here. So uh, moved down in kind of early 2009. So six years ago, mm -hmm. and was with that company for three and a half years. Nice. And what was your role, like your official role at Twilio? So, you know, it's funny. I mean, we gave me the title director of marketing. I joined uh -huh. the company when I was, I think, 22 or 23 years old. So wow. pretty young to be a director. But yeah. it was just helpful to have a title that would open doors. Um, I wore a lot of hats, you know, kind of community manager, built the support team, 
um, pretty much everything not writing the product itself that just uh, extended the time where the founders and then the early team could really stay focused on code. So I tried to handle a lot of the business stuff. Ultimately, around customer acquisition, I acquired the first 100,000 developers on that platform. That's awesome. And you were one of the first or the first employee mm -hmm. there. Yes. What are some critical insights or experiences that you got while you were there that you think have now helped you as a startup CEO? Well, I think just knowing that things are going to be crazy and kind of having tolerance for that, realizing, mm -hmm. you know, everything is kind of broken from a business process perspective because the things that work when you're five people don't work when you're 15 and then again at 50 and, and so on. And I was at Twilio from, you know, there were the three co-founders and then myself and then up until maybe 150 people when wow. I left. So we're scaling through that same period right now at Mattermark and it gives me some sense of like this is normal the messiness of it is how it's supposed to be nice un unavoidable yeah so it keeps you kind of even keel and you know that these things are gonna happen you're not surprised by any of it yeah i mean i was surprised when i was the first time around especially you know not being the founder too i didn't have a lot of control so i just felt like oh my gosh things are constantly breaking like coming out of bigger companies, I wondered if that was a sign that we were really messed up, but now I know that that's just pretty typical. Yeah, it's the, it's the normal. Yeah. Nice. So yeah, let's talk about your new startup, sure. uh, Mattermark. What uh, inspired you to start it? Well, we had been working on a previous company that we shut down, mm -hmm. and after we shut it down, we didn't know what we would do next, but one of the things we were concerned about was we'd gotten pretty burned out working on something we ultimately didn't care about. So we reflected a bit on various projects we'd done just for fun, mm -hmm. hoping we could find some connection between those and building a good business. One that really stuck out to me was up in Seattle, I helped publish a, something called Seattle 2.0. Mm -hmm. It was kind of like TechCrunch, but just for the Seattle ecosystem. And one of the pieces of it was something called the Startup Index. And it had just been local startups, but it would really make people angry. And I think that's a really interesting signal. When people are mad about something, it's like there's something important there that they value that's like being threatened. Yeah, what, um, why were they angry about that? And they'd be that? angry because they would debate, you know, like the rankings. Like, oh, oh I but, see. You know, this thing about this company or, you know, it, and it, was, it would create controversy. And I think also in the Seattle startup culture, that was really awesome because it was sort of a passive culture. So mm -hmm. to get people having that discussion about who was doing well. So I thought, well, what if we did this for the Bay Area? I mean, that was one argument, but this will be like a whole other level right. of conversation. So had that in mind, also just generally feel like there's a big opportunity right now to build better um, press coverage of technology companies. And I think there's a lot of room left for people to innovate on that. So started out thinking media company, mm -hmm. but pretty quickly as we started to compile the data to generate that index and also to help us scoop stories, realizing that that data was super valuable for other people as well. So we were talking to our investors and getting feedback from them, and they pretty quickly asked, can we just access the raw data? We want to do things with it. So that led us down this other path of figuring out what is it they want to do with it, and is that something we could be selling? Yeah. So I know it's been mentioned as like a Bloomberg for private companies. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can talk about why that's unique, what's going on in the private company or startup ecosystem today that you yeah. need this kind of information. Well, I think one important piece of context to set is most companies are private. Yeah. So like 99.9% .9 of companies are private. And I think that, that there's this weird mythology we've bought into that the only companies that matter are the ones that you see on like Fox News or, you know, they're, they're listed, they've got tickers. But it's weird to not see our own jobs represented in those places. And it's pretty crazy that people spend so much of their waking life working and then there's so little representation of that part of life in the media. So we feel that there's just a huge gap not just in terms of traction, but in terms of deeper understanding of how wealth gets created in the world. Mm -hmm. And private companies are private, so they yeah. don't share as much information, they're harder to research, they're harder to comp. You know, Gartner and Forrester and the analyst firms don't necessarily cover them unless they are on kind of like public company track. Mm -hmm. So the opportunity is to build a tool where you can look up those companies as easily as you do public companies and get a rich set of information. Everything from who works there, which you kind of can get from LinkedIn, but right. LinkedIn is really a subset. Um, how much money has the company raised? You can kind of get that from Crunchbase. That's kind of a subset of information. News, you can kind of get that from Google, but there's that's also kind of a subset of. So it's like all this work you have to do, and right. when you start to go down that path, you realize some human being has been tasked with manually putting this together, and that's just not a great use of a smart person's time. They want to do the analysis, not the collection. Yeah. So uh, who uses your product today? So it's about half investors. When we started out, we were very focused on investors. It's mm -hmm. also used pretty heavily by salespeople. Okay. Really any kind of deal maker who uh -huh. needs to qualify pipeline and make sure they're not wasting time on 
deals that they can't close can get value from Mattermark. So a lot of mid-market sales reps who can't get information on kind of that, those mid-sized private companies. Yeah. And we track a lot of those. So we track over a million companies. Wow. Only I'd say 60, maybe 70,000 of those are have funding information. So mm -hmm. there's a whole universe of other companies that are really valuable that you know, they might be bootstrapped, they might just be legacy. Like they were bootstrapped and right. now they're established companies. Got it. And for the um, the data that you're pulling, because you're pulling in a lot of data, mm -hmm. what are some of the sources that you're pulling from and what do you do with that? Yeah, so fortunately and unfortunately, the public internet is awesome. So it's fortunate because lots of data is out there. It's unfortunate because it's unstructured. Mm -hmm. So we spend a lot of time structuring content into data. Mm -hmm. I guess that's the easiest way to think of it. So news, uh, regulatory filings. Um, there are licensable databases out there. You've got sites like AngelList and Crunchbase, which we've kind of started with, but only really talks about the venture-backed part of the universe. Yeah. Um, and then we do a lot of direct submission now with companies where they're bringing us information that we want. So mm -hmm. we integrate things like Google Analytics and iTunes directly into oh, Mattermark so wow. companies can pr verify those parts of their profile. Um, we collect funding information and valuation data directly from both founders and investors. Mm -hmm. So all of that together gives you this holistic view of what's going on inside these companies. Yeah. It's a pretty massive effort. So I know you have a feature that's kind of like page rank for companies. I think it's called your growth score, mm -hmm. or maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so when we were first getting started building Mattermark, we had this UI challenge. Mm -hmm. We have basically a grid or a spreadsheet view when you log in. And the question is, what are the first 10 or 20 companies that you should see? Just like, what are the first 10 or 20 results you should see if yeah. you do a search in Google? And we tried all these different default sorts. Maybe they should be alphabetical. No, that gets you some garbage in the A section. Or maybe that they should be by total funding. Well, then you just get the usual suspects at the top. Right. And no single sort was really good. I don't think that's so shocking in retrospect. And so we started thinking, we need a mix of these things, and we need to understand how do we show you a combination of stuff you, you recognize so that you'll trust us mm -hmm. and then a sprinkling of things that are new that you've never seen among those things you recognize so that you'll feel like you're constantly discovering things that are new. So the growth score is how the ranking works and it's based on the relative rate of change of a bunch of different signals, primarily web traffic, mobile downloads, social media, employee count. Um, we've actually broken out a separate score for mindshare versus growth because growth is a more holistic thing that includes things like employees and funding. Okay. But Mindshare is more just about how much attention are you getting on the I internet. Uh -huh. And um, it's been very valuable, especially over time, because we at first just thought this is a UI solution, and now we think it might be potentially like a back-testable index mm -hmm. or a long-term way of looking at companies. Um, and we're still perfecting it, just like PageRank is, is actually yeah. much more than PageRank today, right. we're continuing to add to that algorithm. Yeah, and how has that changed from its initial inception? Well, I think it changes in both depth and breadth. So in mm -hmm. depth, we just have more historical data, so you can build out an algorithm that considers more around like time cycles. Um, and then breadth has more to do with just additional data points that can be fed into it and figuring out the proper weighting for those and how they move relative to each other. Um, so we used to have a pretty straightforward formula and I, again, kind of like PageRank, I think it used to be just how many credible links. Yeah. It's gotten a little more complicated now. And as, as it gets more complicated and we get bigger, people are actually trying to game it now. Yeah, I was going to ask, have you had any like people contest or companies want to get the inside scoop or try to game it? I mean, people try to ask us. The good news is it's so complicated that like <laughs> no salesperson could like even explain it if, if they wanted to. And there's no harm in helping people think about the signals. If you could make their score go up, like if you could game it, you'd probably actually have a successful company mm -hmm. because it's very hard to game things over time. It's very easy to do short-term hacks. It's mm -hmm. very hard to be a consistent hacker yeah. of those types of metrics. If you're consistently hacking them, you're probably actually doing something good for your company. Um, so it's pretty tough to game, but we do have people sometimes say, you know, we don't want to be listed and it's like, well, then I guess you shouldn't have a website because it's just not, it's just the way <laughs> yeah. it's like, you don't want to be listed in Google either, I right. guess, but that's not really the way that it works. So it, it, it's mainly to help them with discovery and mm -hmm. keep them top of mind. Mm -hmm. So you also have, um, an index called the startup index, similar to what you had in Seattle. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit about that. So we kind of publish different selective lists now, still built around the growth score. Mm -hmm. Um, and we kind of have a top 500. I'm not really ready to say it's the canonical 500, like the S&P 500, uh -huh. but we want to begin to approach some set of companies that we can look at as a bellwether for the overall market. It's pretty hard to talk about the data set 
as a whole, it's very hard for people to hold that in their minds. So getting 500 companies with names you recognize helps people set context for stage and industry, the same, similar to how you have a set right. of comps in the S&P 500. Right. Um, so we continue to publish the way that those companies are doing over time to help the public understand how things are changing. Eventually, we'd like that to be more like a real-time ticker, but right now we publish it on a monthly basis. Yeah, and since these are private companies, you know, they're not releasing earnings reports, right. but do you have any way of getting a sense of what their revenue is, and is that at all important, or how so are So we definitely about it? don't have a direct set of information on that. One of the things we can usually do is figure out more around the spending side of the equation okay. with the amount of employees that they have. Mm -hmm. um, you can also factor in when they last raised money. So if a company has a lot of employees that continues to grow, mm -hmm. but it's like not taking money in three years, right. that is getting funded somehow. Sure. So in the long, um, in the long term or down the road, maybe we'll do some more estimation work there, but there are enough inputs where our customers can build models that can figure that stuff out. Mm -hmm. A lot of these things for our customers, if they need that information, they don't need it until they're far enough along in the relationship where they can ask for it and just get it directly. So our product is very focused on how would you assess if you wanted to talk to the company in the first place. Okay. And good investors will often say, yeah, I don't need to know revenue to start the conversation. I need to know revenue to continue the conversation mm -hmm. and they can get that just by on their own. Yeah. And aside from investors and salespeople, uh, how do startups use your product? Yeah, so there's a number of ways. One is to research investors. So mm -hmm. when they're thinking about fundraising, we have an investor's view so they could say, show me all the investors in Boston who have raised a new fund in the past three years. Maybe you're raising a Series B, so you need a larger check. Maybe you want to say, show me the investors that do Bs, mm -hmm. and their fund is at least $200 million. Mm -hmm. So you could ask that kind of granular question and get back a list, oh, wow. which is awesome because yeah. founders spend a ton of time compiling that. And another big piece is around market comps. So figuring out who else in my space raised recently, from which investors, on what terms, um, and also who are my competitors, mm -hmm. and how do I make sure I'm not going and I'm pitching to a VC who's just back my competitor. Right. Um, so just general market intelligence, and I think one way or another founders do get that information, but right now I think it's a lot more reading. Yeah. It's a lot more going through news articles and blog posts. And I actually think there is value in doing that too, but some of this stuff, like making the list of investors, that's not really where the value is. The value is in the first, having those first conversations with those investors, and I think that people can get to that a lot faster with using us. Definitely, yeah, I have a lot of startups that I advise that basically use virtual assistants mm -hmm. to figure out um, investors in their niche and then figuring out if they're active when the last investment was, so I'm gonna tell them about Mattermark and oh, yeah. help save time for them. You know, it's PA. kind of like one of the things that I find really sad like, or one of the things I really want to fix is that each one of those VAs basically builds a spreadsheet. Yeah. Right? And it's like, how many times has the same spreadsheet been built over right. and over again? So we're kind of like this dynamic canonical spreadsheet that you don't have to keep building. Yeah, no, again. that's fantastic. And for companies that might be bootstrapping or they don't necessarily care about investment right now, um, I assume that looking up the competition and just keeping up with those trends is important, but are there yeah. other areas they can benefit? I think it, with market research, it's a little harder. I don't generally see bootstrap companies spending much money on that, which okay. I think is fine. Right. Uh, I think that if they are in a market where they get a pretty good revenue per customer, they could use us to research and identify very targeted prospect lists. Uh -huh. So we do see that a lot. So we're really popular with sales development teams. In a bootstrapped company, often those companies are a bit smaller. Mm -hmm. um, often the founders are still doing that work. And so it's just an issue of if you've got the CEO or someone running the biz dev team that's identifying those targets, their time is at a premium in a bootstrapped company. Yeah. So we can definitely be very helpful to them. We have special pricing for startups too. So it's really not that expensive. It's about $100 a month to mm -hmm. use Mattermark. So um, we love working with bootstrapped companies. We think that we can actually help them the most because they're the most outside of the kind of echo chamber of startup yeah. information. So they don't always know about their comps or they don't always know about these, you know, startups can be their customer. Right. Um, so I think that there's a lot of opportunity there. Yeah, that's great. So, you know, given that your customers are investors as well as these um, sales development folks, um, let's talk about the investors. How has their behavior changed since using a product like Mattermark? When we started out about two years ago, there was a very new idea that you would use data to invest. So there's definitely an attitude of venture investing being an art, mm -hmm. being a craft. And I, I would never say that it's not in the sense that human relationships are so nuanced. Of course, there's an art to that. 
but a lot of the work that's done before the relationships, a lot of that research that mm -hmm. associates in particular do, is not an art. It is a science. Outside of startup investors, a lot of this process is really codified. So. Mm -hmm. Um, what we've seen is we've seen people hiring teams that have a much higher level of rigor. We've seen them hiring software engineers to work inside of their, com their companies, so bigger firms are hiring their own dedicated engineering team. Um, we're just seeing a lot more curiosity around data, and I think that's a great place to start. I don't necessarily think there are, are that many investors who've really built a unique angle off data yet, mm -hmm. although I think there's an aspiration for that, but right. I think it's more just the subtle shift of like, oh, well, maybe I could answer that question with data, and then letting that be in the toolkit every time that a question comes up. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think in two years that's a pretty good cultural shift to see, and then I think there are a handful of firms, many of them below the radar, that are really building an entire thesis around data, and that's also, I think, something we're going to see a lot more of. Mm -hmm. of, of VC firms. And you think yeah. they're happening at any stage, whether it's early or later stage? I think that there's, it's sort of, um, I'd say there's a barbell. So on the late stage, I think that later stage investing starts to look more like public market investing. Mm -hmm. So it's attractive to people who maybe want to move. They want to move earlier. So if you're an investment banker and you're used to taking companies public, you know that the people who were in the company before it went public get a pretty great premium for that. Mm -hmm. So coming down into the late stage rounds instead is great. So that's one piece. The other side is a volume issue. So on the seed side, there's just so much to look right. at. I think some people really value taking data as a way to provide that first filter. Mm -hmm. So I'm seeing both of those things happening. I'd say the place where it's not changing as much is like the B and the C, the middle, mm -hmm. um, because those are really rounds that are getting done by traditional investors following on. So that, that is the part I see the least disruption. Um, for founders, it probably, I don't know how it feels for founders, but I mean, if anything, I think hopefully investors are asking smarter questions yeah. and they're less likely to get tricked by something that's shiny. And are they mostly companies that are in the U.S., or do you do international startups as well? We do do international startups. I would say our coverage is the best in the United States. Mm -hmm. Actually, I would say our coverage is the best anywhere where, where things are in the English language. Oh, okay. Because of the way we process information, right. it's still going to be a lot of work for us to fully globalize what we're doing. Um, we have pretty awesome coverage in Brazil, in the U.K., in Israel, and in um, India, China, kind of... Where there are real hubs, yeah. I think it's really hard though, like Africa, for example, is an area we've really struggled to track down startups. Mm -hmm. We have angel investors mm -hmm. just sending us spreadsheets full of companies that yeah. we just load into Mattermark at this point. So it's very, very um, early days for those areas. And how do you think behavior for startups has changed or founder behavior? Yeah, I mean, I think this is very much part of a trend that was already happening before we came along, which is founders are becoming more sophisticated, more capable of communicating through metrics. I think there's a huge conversation going on right now about financial information mm -hmm. and founders taking a lot more ownership of having the right controls in place. So I think knowing that hard questions are going to be asked just raises the bar on you to come prepared for a higher level of rigor. I think also the seed deals being done now that are so large mm -hmm. are really Series A deals, and so I think founders are starting to expect Series A level diligence questions, mm -hmm. which I think is super healthy. Um, I think also they're finding out which investors aren't necessarily as sophisticated. So yeah. Sometimes questions you ask say a lot about you. Right. And so I think that there's just a, a lot more... Um, People on both sides are asking each other better questions and are more rigorous, and I think that can only result in good things. Right. That's great. So, last question for you. What is your long-term vision for Mattermark, and how do you see it making an impact in the private markets and beyond? So, ultimately, we'd like to track all 250 million companies globally. Mm -hmm. um, we'd like you to be able to look up any company and get rich information on that company and then integrate that into your workflow, whether that's starting to invest or starting to think about them as a sales lead or a supplier or a vendor or a, tra you know, a financial transaction or whatever that starting point is, um, and be a utility on the same level with Wikipedia or Google or LinkedIn where getting that information, there's a promise behind our brand that mm -hmm. if you want to look up a company, there's no better place to start. Um, as far as the impact on the private markets, I think there is a future where private markets are a lot more like the public markets and so I think it's really a good idea for investors to be as knowledgeable as possible. I think that's just happening with Angelist and a lot of other market mm -hmm. trends and we're just a piece of that wave um, because I think a lot of wealth creation can happen from very small numbers of people now. It's really yeah. exciting. Wonderful. Any final words for our viewers about Mattermark? 
I think I'd be remiss if I didn't say we're hiring. Yeah. Um, particularly in marketing right now. So we have a really strong content marketing uh, arm. So if you love to write about data and have maybe been an analyst or a broker in the past, we would really love to work with you. Um, we have a lot of investment bankers and um, consultants. And I think people who normally maybe it's not considered like cool for them to join your startup. We love these people. We love spreadsheet nerds. So all of those people in the world, if you're listening, should they should apply. And then of course on the software engineering side, um, really everything is mm -hmm. an option. So if you think what we're doing is cool, I think that's what we really care about. But particularly in machine learning, mm -hmm. we do do quite a bit with machine learning and neural networks. It's pretty fun. So yeah. if that's a passion for listeners, then I would hope they'd reach out. So thank you, Danielle, for joining us today. Thank you. And thank you viewers for joining us today as well. And special thanks to our sponsor, Pivotal Tracker, for helping in producing this episode of Femgineer TV. If you've enjoyed this episode of Femgineer TV, then please share it with your friends, your teammates, and your boss. And let us know in the blog comments below what your favorite part of the episode was. Subscribe to Femgineer's YouTube channel to receive the next and last episode for the 2015 season. Thanks for tuning in today, and I'm looking forward to reading your comments. This episode of Femgineer TV is brought to you by Pivotal Tracker. Build better software faster. When you're working at a startup, you're pretty heads... That thing went down. Oh. <laughs> Whether you care about taking investment now or in the future or just bootstrapping your business, whether you're bootstrapping your business or care about taking funding now versus later doesn't really matter. What does matter is that you keep up with these startup trends and note what the industry... Whether you're bootstrapping, looking to get investment later versus now, or you're whether you're bootstrapping your business, looking to get investment now or later, or you're just concerned about... Okay. Yeah. Here we go. <laughs> if you've enjoyed this episode, then please share it with your friends. I'll wait till they quiet down a little. Should we start from the top? So this it's, is like it's probably lunchtime. Yeah, I think oh, it's, it's, okay. it's okay. We're, 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 we're like okay, 30 just, seconds from being done. Yeah. Hey, it's Pornima. As you know, I'm working on my second book. It's called Present, The Techie's Guide to Engaging an Audience. And this time, I'm co-authoring it with Karen Catlin. Pornima and I are both technical women who have given hundreds of talks. But in the beginning, they weren't all exactly great. Now we have studied the greats, we have learned from our mistakes, and we wrote the book we wish we had had when we started our public speaking journey. The book is available now for pre-order, so check it out, and if you like it, which we're pretty confident that you will, reserve your copy today.